So the gameplay trailer for the Shadow of the Erd Tree DLC just dropped, and it's also extremely story heavy. Pure and radiant, he wields love to shrive clean the hearts of men. And this is very much the story of Mikola. Let's learn what we can. There is nothing more terrifying. You'll recognize Mikola's cocoon here. It's located in Mogwin Palace and that is the DLC access point that will give way to this. What they're calling the Land of Shadow, a place that you can explore on June 21st as long as you've defeated Moog and Radan. According to Miyazaki, the DLC is at least the same size as Limgrave in the base game, and this will be their largest DLC to date. In that forsaken place, blood must spill. Blood of your fellows. They are truly faithful. Interviews also reveal that there will be eight new weapon categories and at least ten new bosses. They were never saints. They just happen to be on the losing side of a war. Enemies here are the vestiges of a war that occurred in the Land of Shadow long ago. They've just been obscured by the Erd Tree until now. So many feature designs that would be considered cursed or blasphemous in the Lands Between. And there's no better example of that than the newest member of Marika's family, Mesma. Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of light? We're entering the DLC as a tarnished that was sanctioned to become Elden Lord. But it seems events in the base game might pale in comparison to what's playing out here with Mikola, who arrived long before we did. I presume you, too, are keen to know just what kind Mikola is doing here. So let's talk about everything. I have analyzed every frame, translated every interview, and kind of haven't slept in two days. So good night, and I hope you enjoy. Those stripped of the race of gold shall all meet death in the race of restless. Come now, touch the withered arm, and travel to the realm of shadow. I will not be far behind. May we meet again. Before we break down the story, I'm going to highlight what I think are three of the biggest gameplay details that I found hidden in some translated interviews. First, Elden Ring's DLC will actually feature a new power scaling feature that will come into play while you're in the Land of Shadow. Here, our character will be able to upgrade their attack power in a way that is separate from your rune level. Let me explain that. So, Miyazaki mentions that this system is somewhat similar to how attack power works in Sekiro. In Sekiro, you don't level attributes to do more damage like you would do in Elden Ring. Instead, your attack power can be raised by defeating certain bosses and claiming their memories. So a system like this is being added to Elden Ring, and it will be a new way to get stronger in the DLC in addition to using runes to level up, as you're used to. The reason this is being added is because From Software know that there are a lot of players who will be going into the DLC at high levels with their completed characters. And so instead of having players with completed characters just steamrolling the content, they want players to have that classic experience of struggling against bosses and needing to explore other areas to get stronger and to try again. So by adding a new attack power resource, and hopefully also by scaling our characters appropriately, I think this idea could be genius. And it's especially important for a game like Elden Ring to have this, because this game will live or die by the enormous expansive world it has, and you need to want or need to explore that world. Next, of course the DLC will be getting many new weapons, but most interesting is that these new weapons span eight new weapon categories. Elden Ring already had a ton of weapon types, so getting eight more is actually kind of insane. 
So far we know six of these new categories. One is the dueling shield, which combines offense and defense. Another are these reverse grip swords that we see being wielded in this clip. And then there's weapons that enable a martial arts style, reminiscent of the Dragon Bone Fist from Dark Souls 2, or the Senpo Monks from Sekiro. Miyazaki also mentions a large Japanese sword and a new large sword, whatever that means. But personally, I'm most excited for these. These are equipable throwing weapons where all of your melee attacks are thrown attacks. Elden Ring always had really smooth ranged gameplay, but the weapons were so bad that it just wasn't worth playing, so I really hope these are viable. Anyway, the third gameplay point I want to mention is that, again, Miyazaki says that the DLC area should be at least the same size as Limgrave, but you need to bear in mind, this is coming from the same humble man who told everyone that Elden Ring would take eh, about 30 hours to complete. So I wouldn't be surprised if Miyazaki is underselling the size of the DLC here, if anything. But that's enough about gameplay for now, let's talk lore. Shortly after the DLC trailer released, I received an email from Namco Bandai about it, and they included this short poem. It reads, The Land of Shadow a place obscured by the Erd Tree, where the goddess Marika first set foot, a land purged in an unsung battle, set ablaze by Mesma's flame. It was to this land that Mikola departed, divesting himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage, of all things golden. And now Mikola awaits the return of his promised lord. Let's break that down, starting with the Land of Shadow, According to interviews with Miyazaki, the Land of Shadow is a place that has become physically disconnected from the Lands Between. So this isn't an alternate version of the Lands Between, nor does it seem like we'll be going backwards or forwards in time to access the DLC for once. And that is refreshing compared to past From Software DLCs. I am excited for a DLC that will expand on the present world for once, rather than a past or future world. That said, if anything, the Land of Shadow will definitely contain many remnants of the past, as it is a place obscured by the Erd Tree, where the goddess Marika first set foot. If this place can be obscured simply because the Erd Tree exists, then I lean towards thinking that this might have always been some sort of shadowy dimension, rather than once physically being a part of the lands between landmass, although there is a nicely sized gap right in the middle of the lands between where this might fit. Uh, but I think the Erd Tree does generate a ton of light, so the idea of a land of shadow being obscured by the Erd Tree kind of makes a lot of sense. As for why this place became obscured by the Erd Tree, I think we can lay the blame squarely at the feet of Marika, since the age of the Erd Tree is her age, after all, and this age only came about when she ascended to godhood and became the vessel of the Elden Ring. The biggest part that's always been missing from Marika's story is what happened before she became a god, and the shadow of the Erd Tree seems to hide the answers to that exact question, since the poem calls the land of shadow the place where the goddess Marika first set foot. Marika setting foot in this place before setting foot in the lands between makes a lot of sense, because we've always known that Marika isn't from the lands between. She's a part of the Numen race and the Numen are said to have come from outside the Lands Between. The character creator calls the Numen supposed descendants of denizens of another world. So either this other world is the Land of Shadow and Marika originates from there, or Marika comes from somewhere outside the Lands Between and outside the Land of Shadow, but simply set foot in the Land of Shadow before venturing to the Lands Between. Either interpretation could be true at this point, I think. 
At any rate, it seems like the Land of Shadows is extremely important to Marika's past. Miyazaki drops a huge detail on that note, stating that the Land of Shadows is the place where Marika became a god and the Golden Tree was born. I can't wait for the DLC to elaborate on those circumstances. When Marika did claim the Elden Ring, her most significant act was removing the Rune of Death from it. Afterwards, many previous cultures of death were rendered obsolete, as souls were now supposed to return to the Erd Tree. So if souls started to return to the Erd Tree, where they were presumably reborn, where were souls going before that? Now, this is just speculation, but is it possible souls once went to the land of shadow? Could the land of shadow once have been a sort of afterlife? As evidence for this claim, consider that A. Mikola only managed to depart to the land of shadow when he divested himself of his grace and his flesh, so his death led to him being here. Next, trailer dialogue explains that those stripped of the grace of gold shall all meet death in the embrace of Mesmer's flame. So those who are stripped of the grace of gold have to meet death in this place. And the last bit of evidence for this speculation is that there already is a shadowy realm of death alluded to in Elden Ring lore called the Helfen. So, since we know that the Erd Tree disrupted the previous cycles of death in the Lands Between, it definitely makes sense to me that the Erd Tree might obscure the Land of Shadow beyond just being a bright source of light. It might have replaced its existence as a sort of afterlife, but I could definitely be wrong on the afterlife stuff, so let me know what you think. At any rate, the Land of Shadow has now become relevant again for the Tarnished have found a way to enter this forsaken place. The poem goes on to read, A land purged in an unsung battle, set ablaze by Mesmer's flame. I interpret this as the land was purged in an unsung battle, and then it was set ablaze by Mesmer's flame. These seem to be two separate things. So first, let's talk about the war unsung battle. In an interview, Miyazaki references the war when he was asked about this wicker man enemy, and replies, so this giant basket of flame was a terrible, gruesome weapon used in a war that occurred in the Land of Shadow. The kindling that you see is actually the remains of bodies that were put in there to burn. As for whose enemies were put inside the wicker man, I'd wager that it was Marika's enemies, since she's the one who came out victorious as a god, and with the golden tree as well. Just speculation though. Zully the Witch points out that the Wicker Man traces its origins back to Celtic myth, where people were allegedly sacrificed within a Wicker statue, and many other users have pointed out that this design may have instead been drawn from Berserk. They were never saints. They just happen to be on the losing side of a wall. If you look closely, you can actually see a mane of red hair attached around a face on the Wicker Man's upper thighs. Red hair like this is referenced in the Giant's Red Braid, which reads, Every giant is red of hair, and Radigan was said to have despised his own red locks. Perhaps that was a curse of their kind. Incidentally, the red hair here is just one of many symbols in the trailer that are considered blasphemous over in the Lands Between. Omen horns, for example, are another such symbol of despised beings under the Golden Order, and Omen horns are seen here on the Wicker Man, here upon the Lion Dancer, here on these enemies, and even upon the roaring Rune Bear thing, which also has that red hair. And then there's this hippo thing that's using an aspect of the Crucible, which were also aspects that became despised and scorned. And then there's a spirit wielding the Iron Cleaver that's the signature weapon of the Misbegotten, who were also despised. So lots of blasphemous symbols going on, but no character in the DLC has as many of them as 
Mesmer, who is the character that is at the heart of the Shadow of the Erd Tree DLC, maybe even more so than Mikola. This is the demigod who would set ablaze the land of Shadow. Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of light? So this is Mesmer, and the mother he mentions is Queen Marika. An official interview makes this quite clear. To quote Miyazaki, and you may have seen at the end of the trailer, there was this piece of key art where it shows Mesmer sat in this throne-like chair, and people who've played the game may recognize this throne to be one of those from the boss room where you battle Morgoth, and this represents the thrones at the base of the Erd Tree, and it's supposed to symbolize that Mesmer stands on equal footing to these other demigods and children of Marika who sat around in these thrones and held the rooms of the Erd Tree. So he is an important figure who rivals these other demigods. And as you play the DLC, you will learn a little about why he wasn't featured in The Legends of the Erd Tree, The Lands Between. You'll realize why he exists in this shadow, this land of shadow. As to who Mesmer's father is, well, there are many signs that they're a product of Radigan. For one, there's the red hair, and then there's the fact that Mesmer's name starts with M, which suits the naming convention for the children of Marika Radigan, who are Mikola, Melania, and possibly Melina. Speaking of Melina, we've talked many times about the butterfly theory, which posits that all children of Radic and Marika have a butterfly of their own. Mikola's is the nascent butterfly, Melania's is the Aeonian butterfly, and since Melina is the kindling maiden, we've long speculated that hers was the smoldering butterfly, but now it seems that butterfly could belong to Mesma instead, given his much more overt flame symbolism. That said, there is a fourth pink butterfly featured in the trailer now, so it's possible the butterfly theory might still have wings. If Mesmer was legitimately born alongside the other children of Marika Radigan, that actually places his existence a little bit later in the timeline. Still in the age of the Erd Tree, but after Radigan left Renala for Marika. Whatever the case, Mesmer would find himself in the Land of Shadow, delivering death to those stripped of the grace of gold. Those stripped of the grace of gold shall all meet death in the embrace of Mesmer's flame. Since this line is delivered by a third party, it seems there's a common belief here that Mesmer's role is to deliver death to those stripped of grace who find themselves in the Land of Shadow, including, apparently, our Tarnished, who finds themselves at odds with Mesmer. Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of light? In this dialogue, I think Mesmer is questioning why Marika has seen fit to restore grace to the tarnished and sanction their lordship, guiding them to become Elden Lord, even though in his eyes we are bereft of light. Mesmer strikes me as a bit of a rebel and an outcast. He's not what you'd expect from someone who is clearly killing people who have been stripped of the grace of gold. But I do ultimately think that he holds Marika in high regard. I do think he's doing this on her behalf. The fact that he sits on a demigod's throne might be evidence enough, uh, but in an excellent bit of photo manipulation by user Wusa69 on Reddit, we can clearly spy a statue of what seems to be Marika in the background. It has her signature braid and her armband as well, and uniquely, she's holding a baby, who could be Mesmer, but that's just speculation. We know Marika uses people, 
even her enemies, even the blasphemous. She will keep a fire giant alive just so it can watch over something for eternity. She will disguise herself as Radigan, make her biggest rival fall in love with him and then abandon that rival and undo them from within. She will condemn the misbegotten and then get one of them to craft weapons for a tarnished so that they can become Elden Lord. So in a similar way, I feel like Mesmer being useful to Marika, despite very clearly being a blasphemous character, really isn't that strange. But what do I mean about Mesmer being blasphemous? Well, first, there's the snakes. According to the Gravekeeper Cloak, the snake is viewed as a traitor to the Erd Tree. And now we don't know if they're talking about Mesmer's snake or the Great Serpent, which is what we assumed before. Whatever the case, there's no way that Mesmer's snakes would be looked upon favorably by the Golden Order. In the Erd Tree Colosseums, for example, the audience delighted in seeing the bronze snakes on the armor of the gladiators be beaten and battered. And then there's Mesmer's usage of flame. According to the Spark Aromatic, fire was prohibited to those who served the Erd Tree. And while this rule was forgotten as the war drew ever on, I do think Mesmer might have some links to the flame of the Fell God, if I had to guess. He's got the red hair, and snakes do appear on the giant's flame forge in the mountaintops, but I'll admit these connections are pretty shaky. We don't know exactly what kind of flame Mesmer is using just yet. Lastly, Mesmer clearly has a connection to Dragon Communion, which is also something that's frowned upon. Dragon Communion is the abhorrent act of consuming the hearts of dragons to commune with the ancient dragons and become more like them. According to the Magma Worm's Scale Sword, Dragon Communion is a grave transgression for which many partakers were cursed to crawl on their bellies as shadows of their former selves. As evidence for Mesmer's Communion, his one good eye is yellow and slitted, which is a clear symptom of consuming the dragon hearts that even our tarnished gets afflicted with. And not to mention his winged armor looks a lot like the Drake Knight set, which is a set that labels the Drake Knights as partakers of communion. Then there's this symbol on the box art and even the fire he conjures that looks a little bit like the dragon communion seal, but it's not a one-to-one -one match. And then serpents themselves are considered imperfect dragons, in Dark Souls lore, at least. And Mesmer's serpents are sprouting draconic wings, so there could be something there. On this promotional page, we also learn that Mesmer's full title is Mesmer the Impaler. And it could be that this name simply comes from his fighting style, but I will also point out, as many others have already, that there is a catacomb in the Lands Between called the Impaler's Catacombs. So it's possible he got this reputation from certain deeds that he committed in the Lands Between. Of all the characters I can think of, only the Fire Giants and Marika come to mind as ever being impaled. The Fire Giants' stakes aren't identical to Mesmer's spear, but they are similar, and Marika being impaled at the end of the game never really had a good explanation, so maybe this is a chance for them to explain that, finally. So in conclusion, I get the vibe that Mesmer is this rebellious, kind of blasphemous child, but that they're still loyal and, more importantly, still useful to their mother, who is Marika. Though, of course, all my opinions and speculations in this video especially are very subject to change. Next, let's talk about Mikola. Mikola is many things. He is the demigod son of Queen Marika and her consort Radigan. He is Mikola the Nascent, cursed with eternal youth. He is Mikola the Unalloyed, who sought to find a cure for his sister's scarlet rot. 
He is Saint Trina, an alter ego who deals in sleep and dreams, and he is Mikola of the Halig Tree, a sort of Erd tree that he eventually embedded himself within. He's also the subject of an hour-long lore video on my channel, and I'm also going to be talking about him again later this week in a lore video about Moog, so please forgive me for being brief in my description of him here. Suffice to say though, Mikola is a very important demigod. He's also an Empyrean, which means he is a rare character eligible to become a god and succeed Queen Marika. Additionally, his sister says that he is the most fearsome Empyrean of all, and that he possesses the wisdom, the allure of a god. It's this allure that has led to his fate in the base game, which is to say he appears to be dead at the hands of Moog, who is Mikola's demigod half-brother. Moog ripped Mikola's cocoon out of the Halig tree and abducted him. Now Mikola's cocooned flesh lies in Mogwin Palace, and his withered arm there will become the entrance to the DLC. Miyazaki elaborates on this point, stating that Mikola has travelled to the land of shadow for his own reasons, and it's up to the player to follow in his footsteps, as many other NPCs also have before you. The poem reads, it was to this land that Mikola departed, divesting himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage, of all things golden. The fact that Mikola has divested himself of his flesh reminds me a lot of Rani, who slays her own flesh intentionally in order to free her from the control of the two fingers. Through his own death, it seems, he has departed to the land of shadow though now he is without his strength. He's also likely divested himself from his great rune, which is probably this one seen here, which takes the same shape as this emote you get for pre-ordering, which is called Ring of Mikola. So all of this should explain why he needs you. The poem continues, and now Mikola awaits the return of his promised lord. If I had to guess where we're ultimately headed, it would be the castle here, right beneath the shadow of the Erd Tree. Here, an Ark is catching the bounty of the Erd Tree, just like the Rune Arks do, and the sky above is enwreathed by these ethereal cloth tapestries. According to Miyazaki, these tapestries are a veil, and they are a symbol of the Land of Shadows being hidden from the world outside. And speaking of veils, the Black Knives are assassins that are invisible due to their concealing veils. And we have a talisman that is a part of those veils, put together from dark cloth with a lustrous sheen that completely hides the wearer's presence. Earlier, we talked about how Marika was likely responsible for the Land of Shadow being concealed or veiled, and According to the Black Knife Armor, the Black Knives are rumored to be Newman who had close ties with Marika herself, so maybe we're already starting to understand the nature of this veil. That said, the way this veil is laid brings to mind a lot of things. At first it reminded me of Marika's bedchambers, then I thought maybe it could represent Moog's bloody bedchamber, as he puts it. Or it could even represent the Baldekins of the Deathbed Companions, which, according to the Baldekins' blessings, are hidden temples in the guise of a bedchamber. This could represent Mikola's long-awaited rebirth, or maybe his eternal nascence. It could even represent the fact that he is Saint Trina, an alter ego that has to do with sleep and dreams. So many things. Speaking of Saint Trina, though, there's a brief shot of a masked character who looks like they're sleeping in a purple swamp. The droopy flowers in the background might be St. Trina's lilies, and the purple haze of this swampy area definitely gives off sleep effect vibes. You might recall when Rani first meets with you in Elden Ring, she does so amidst a mist, 
which has put Kale and his donkey to sleep nearby. And the more I think about it, the more I think this encounter might have to do with Mikola. In this moment, Rani gives you the spirit calling bell and three wolves, which she says are from Torrent's former master. And considering we see what looks to be Mikola riding Torrent here in the Land of Shadow, I think we can reason that Torrent is Mikola's steed, and thus that Mikola has given you gifts via Rani and favoured you ever since the very beginning of the game. But the rabbit hole goes deeper, because Melina is the one who gives you Torrent's whistle at the start of the game. And since we've now learned that Torrent was likely in the Land of Shadow with Mikola, does that mean that Melina would have ventured to the Land of Shadow to retrieve Torrent from Mikola at some point? Remember, Melina's origins are largely unresolved in Elden Ring, so I really hope we learn more about her story in this place. The fact that she might have traveled to a land that's enwreathed in Mesmer's flame might also explain why she's burned and bodiless, but now I'm just engaging in unhinged speculation and these theories might have got out of hand. But let me do unhinged speculation on one more thing, and I want to draw your attention to the fact that we've learned that it's necessary to kill Radan to access the DLC. That's curious. It seems to hint that his death is essential for events in the Land of Shadow to make sense. Logically, this would be related to the meteor shower that happens after you kill him, right? Because it's in this moment that the fate in the night sky is suddenly let free. Perhaps Melania was even chasing this world state where fate is freed from the night sky, and maybe she was sent here to kill Radan on behalf of Mikola when she fought him all those years ago. What's crazy is we still don't know why Melania fought Radan, so hopefully we get an answer for that as well. And of course, most of you won't have to worry about killing Radan, as your characters are likely already at the end of the story. And speaking of the end of the story, uh, Miyazaki's recent interview reveals that they don't currently have plans to make a second DLC for Elden Ring, so whatever ending that's coming with Mikola might be the final one. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's shaping up to be a good ending with Mikola. Pure and radiant, he wields love to shrive clean the hearts of men. There is nothing more terrifying. To shrive is to hear confession, to assign penance and absolve someone. It sounds like a pretty harrowing process, and that is a perfect match for Mikola who is described as both benevolent and fearsome. This is that ominous love of Mikola, which is a really unique vibe, and I'm very excited to see where things will go. Believe it or not, I've still got a lot of the trailer to break down, but first, I'd like to finally reveal this. This is the Shadow of the Great Tree, a unique displate design that I wanted to create where you can flip it upside down and get a completely different perspective. There's two prints in one here. So this way, it's the giant tree with roots snaking through the city below in the second half. But put the other way, it's a city with the trees of the underworld holding up the world. This is all made possible thanks to Displate's innovative magnet system where prints can be easily stuck onto walls in whatever orientation you'd like without damaging your walls at all. If you get in quick, you can get this print for 22% off with the link below, and if you add any other prints to that order, you'll get 33% off everything, no matter what else you add to your cart. I have a whole set of other prints that you can browse on my page, or you can even get official Elden Ring prints on display. So I'll leave a link to all of that in the description as well. Thank you for supporting my videos with any purchases you make. 
Let me quick fire some observations at you before I go, since there's a lot I couldn't quite fit into the previous parts of the video. First, this is my favorite enemy design in the trailer. It's body is actually made up of three or four robed humanoid beings, and they're all coordinating together to puppeteer this beast, just like the traditional lion dancers from Chinese culture. It's amazingly inspired. According to Miyazaki, there was a culture that existed before the golden tree, and the lion dancer is derived from that culture. Next up, this character who sits alone in a room filled with debris, Quelag over on YouTube has acutely noted that they look very much like the scholar who appears upon the Carrion Inverted statue, which is a key item given to you by Rani during her questline. The area they appear in seems to also feature the many bird cages of Raya Lucaria, so it's exciting to see that we might be learning more about some of the Glintstone sorcerers. Next, this character wears the deep navy hood of expatriated royalty, and the hood was gifted to those who saw the guidance of grace, who then departed on missions to faraway lands, from which they would never return. They cast a completely new spell type, and in the background we see lion statues with omen horns, and the fact that these lions with omen horns are venerated might suggest that this was from a time when horns were seen as signifiers of the divine and not symbols of ill omen. Also, I was so excited to see this player cast these golden wings. We have many aspects of the crucible spells, but we could never cast the wings, which until this point were only able to be utilized by the crucible knights. And I don't think that's the only new Crucible spell we're getting access to. A new screenshot shows the Tarnished using these golden porcupine spines, the same ones utilized by this deformed hippo enemy after it charges, and the sound it makes is just like a Crucible spell. But I wonder if this pot thrown by the player character is a spell or a consumable or a weapon art. Speaking of new screenshots, I want to know the story behind this guy. I will protect him with my life. It seems like he appears in this same field of blue flowers, which, if you look carefully, has that grave that has a hole in it that you find in Morn's castle. There's also, of course, this red dancer character. There are a couple of dancer characters in Elden Ring, so maybe she's related to that. Oh, and I also adore the design on this guy, who is attempting this impossible task of wrenching a sort of spinal golden ribcage through a hole in his skull. Interested to see what happens after that. And if you look closely at his robes, you'll notice he's actually the same character as the man in this portrait at another point in the trailer. So there's clearly a story here especially if they're worthy of a portrait, right? Next to this man is a woman who looks a little bit like a deathbed companion. The origins of the deathbed companions were alluded to in the base game, so it seems kind of fitting that we might explore those origins further in the Land of Shadow, but who knows? I also wonder if this enemy could be a Knight of Radan. They use gravitational magic, as a lot of his knights do. Uh, they're also armored somewhat similarly, and they ride a boar, and Radan's helmet has boar-like tusks, so that might be a thing. Uh, but there's just too much to speculate over. Could this armor be related to the knight's cavalry? This Twitter user points out that Mesmer's statue looks a lot like the pose of the clean rot knight. Is there a reason for that? Could these black knights with gold trim be related to Malaketh? Are the people who are wearing masks part of House Mirai? Why is the top of this castle blackened and disintegrating into the sky? Why is there a line of birds standing before you in this swamp? Is this character afflicted by frenzy? Are they a worm face? Their posture is kind of similar. Are we getting rune bear communion spells? And a huge question, why does Mesmer only have one functioning eye? 
so many questions, but I guess it'll have to wait. Subscribe for more Elden Ring lore in the coming weeks, and subscribe to keep up with all the biggest news regarding the DLC. Thank you to MissPap1 for helping me with the edit for this video, and thank you to all of those I referenced in this video and in the description. Check out the new displate if you're interested, and thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.